Hello and welcome to Our Time. Born in Sydney, Jeremy Cordeaux began his career in radio during 1962 at the age of 16 when he became an errand boy for John Laws at 2GB in Sydney. In 1976, he moved to Adelaide. Here he hosted the Court of Public Opinion on 5DN for almost 30 years. He's never retired and has received many awards, including the Order of Australia and was inducted into the Commercial Radio Hall of Fame. He's also received a knighthood from the Order of St John. And there's so much more to talk about, and we will. Hello, Jeremy. (laughs) How are you? How's that for a little bit of an introduction of all of the accolades you've received in your amazing career? Do you know what it's like? They tell you... When you drown, your life goes before you like that, you know. Cause <laughs> oh, well, you'll take a long time drowning well, if that's the case. Yeah, I suppose. But in this business, you're lucky to sort of stay around long enough to have a thing called history. Yes, isn't that the truth? And it's such an important thing to have. The sad thing is we don't always get a chance to hand that on to the next generation. No, there's a forgetfulness, and I don't know whether it's contrived or accidental, whatever, Uh, All the mistakes that media make and politicians make and people make. Keep making. And it's all about, it's all in history. The one thing we learn from history is we learn nothing from history. Yes. But going back to when you were 16 and starting Mm. in radio, uh, you probably felt like all 16-year-olds, once you got there, you could change the world. Oh, no, I just wanted to be close to this magical business uh, called radio. Uh, when I was at school, I used to listen to John Laws and Ken Sparks and Brian Henderson and all of these fabulous names. They were stars. They lived like stars. They did. They behaved like stars. They did. And to a young kid, of course, it's absolutely mesmerising. Well, they were also a lot of the first faces on television. So you could oh, listen yes. to them on the radio. Yeah, yeah. You actually knew what they looked like because... Normally, yeah, you yeah, wouldn't yeah, know what yeah, a radio... Yeah. It's the old saying, you've got a good head for radio. Yeah, but it is. Radio uh, is a good grounding because the pictures somehow do have to get in the way. But when you think about the old serials, which were basically uh, exploiting and capturing this thing called theatre of the mind... Yes, all happened in your head. Yes, it all happened in your yeah. head. And I remember even at the age of 16 at 2GB in the early 60s, they were still making the serials down on the first floor in Studio C. And they could do everything from stage of battle, horses galloping, yes. people being shot. The coconuts oh. from the horses. <laughs> it's I, usually gravel and two coconuts. I yeah, yes. love it. I love it. See, what's interesting yeah. about this is that you were there when everyone had in radio had sort of understood how to make it work. Yeah. Well, it's... Like in television. When television started, nobody really knew how to make TV. And you've no. been through that process as well, as have I. Yes, well, it was a natural thing to go to because when I was at uh, uh, 2GB as an office boy, I uh, eventually I got to the country and I had a, a little system whereby there were enough radio stations in Sydney to have a list of about uh, oh, six or seven that would be likely to hire me. So I would, I would go to... Uh, various people who had radio schools. You know, you've got to be keen. You've got to really oh, be passionate about it's it. It's all or everything, really, isn't it? Well, it took me six months to get from the top of my list to the bottom of my list, and then <laughs> I'd start at the top of the list again. Yes. And eventually, um, a marvellous man by the name of Philip Jeeves, who worked for 2CH, which was the key station of the AWA network. Yes, I remember that. And they that. had a whole lot of stations in the country. Yes. And... He looked at me and he said, you're not going to go away, are you? <laughs> I, think, I think, Jeremy, I will hire you to get rid of you. <laughs> it's persistence. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, there's a job going at 2GF Grafton and there you will, you will either get this out of your system or you will be smitten for life. So away I went and then within about two years I was back doing Midnight to Dawn at 2KY and then... Uh, from there to Channel 10 and then back to 2GB. So people, uh, people in perhaps our age range may remember the shows you did do on television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I did Blind Date. 
it's such an unfortunate name when oh. you think about it in the sense that yeah. they could have all been blind, the people <laughs> trying to date each other. Uh, it, it's a rehash of programs of, that have been around a course. long. And yes. they still bring back those dating, they do. dating shows, all that, Perfect Match. Yeah, but the, the plethora of all these weird dating shows at the moment, giving roses backwards and forwards and so on, they're, really, yeah. they're sort of an extension of what those shows were originally, I guess. Yeah, so we kept it to half an hour and we tried to keep it moving and interesting. Uh. But it wasn't, <laughs> yes, but there wasn't such a strong sexual undertone. Now well, it's not so much well, under, it's over. Well, it certainly wasn't, not before the cameras anyway. No, exactly. Well, exactly. <laughs> I have no idea what, what went on behind the cameras. You sent them away <laughs> on a date and no one knew. Oh, yes. But look, getting back to you, so there was a process of getting into radio when you started, which yes. you started as an office boy or messenger boy or... Well, that's how you did it. Yep. That's the And you learned, you learned how it worked from yes. the ground up. Yes. Then the next process was you went to a country radio station, yep. if you were lucky. And then, as you said, you kept applying to come back into the city. Absolutely right. And eventually, if, if you don't get deterred and you are totally manic in your uh, determination to get back, you will get back. You Tough are... to have a private life, though, isn't it? Um, well, I, I don't think if you really are totally focused on getting somewhere in your life, everything becomes secondary to that. Well, it becomes your life is the reality. Yes, yes. And the people around you who are close to you in that life have to understand mm. that the only way you got there and the only way you're going to stay there is to eat it, sleep it, breathe it 24-7. Well, even more so when you're doing the midnight to dawn shifts as well. Oh, well, yes. I remember finishing midnight to dawn at 2KY and then being at Channel 10 by 7 o'clock to read the breakfast news then I worked all day through until about six o'clock when I did the weather forecast in the evening news. You didn't do it as a lady, I hope. No, I, I, no, I, no, okay. no, no, no. Okay. No one even <laughs> suggested that. It's <laughs> funny about that. It's just that weather girls became the norm and everyone accepted girls would tell you about the weather, which mm. was a really weird I don't know concept. where that came from. No, I know. but I think it's weird? just using, introducing a little bit of glamour. I, well... In some cases, yes. So, <laughs> so you'll pay for that well, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, dear friend Anne Wills, who was sort of oh, the, well. the 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 doyen of weather girls. Well, she was a star. Oh. Is a star. It still is. Yes. 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 Um, so, how long were you in Sydney for? Because Sydney being sort of your <sighs> initial home base. Well, one thing you learn is that uh, you've got all of the. Uh, frailties and uh, risk factors in entertainment and show business. And then you've got another layer, which is executive stupidity. <laughs> which you can which say is the now. one you've really got to watch out for. But you were an executive. You owned oh, how, many, how many radio stations uh, did you three. end up with? Three. I owned three. And yes. I've gone from office boy to announcer to uh, <laughs> producer, executive <laughs> producer, Station manager, general manager, managing director. <laughs> and I've done it all. And but really, you, you have to do it all. But were you good? Were uh, you good to the young bloke who was 16 oh my at the God, same yes. time? I remember those days very because clearly. Because you went through it. And most executives don't go through that but, process. Yes, you've got to do that. And yeah. people, people, bless them. They teach you. And if you've got the sense to listen yeah. and learn, you'll yeah. be fine. I was taught when I first started in the industry... Keep your mouth shut, your mm. eyes open, mm. and your ears open, which is very true. Uh, yeah, well, just you back to the... You can't keep your mouth shut on radio. That's the only thing. <laughs> it's a bit, bit of a... a bit of a, pro bit of a not, trick. Not quite the way it works. No, but, but just going back to those days at 2GB when uh, we were the key station of mm. the Macquarie Network. Yep. This was the most august uh, senior talk station in the country being the key station of all those stations, like 3AW and 4BH and uh, 6PR and uh, indeed 5DN. Yes. Um, then along comes <laughs> management and says, well, I, I, think we're in, I, I don't think we'll do this talk thing anymore. <laughs> we are going to become a music station. And of course that fell flat on its face. But if it hadn't, and I, 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 I thank them because uh, I had just got married and I had just had a baby and 
Tell had a mortgage. Very painful for you. Well, it happens. Yeah, okay. And I, I was faced with th those moments in radio and television where you know the axe is going to fall. Anyway, bless their hearts, they didn't sack me. They kept me on staff. And eventually when those people knew their day was up to, they very kindly said, look, there's a job in Adelaide. Well, hang on a tick. We'll find out more about that job in Adelaide in just a moment. Welcome back. Our special guest is Jeremy Cordeaux, and we're just talking about you moving to Adelaide yes. for a job in Adelaide at 5DN. And by the way, Malcolm, thank you for having me here. This is oh, absolute lovely pleasure. of you. Beautiful. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Um, do yeah, you well, know, I... the, the reality is, and one of, the, one of the lovely things about having somebody like you on this program, is there's going to be a whole lot of people watching this who know who you are, but probably don't know your whole background because one of the things you can't do oh, when yes, you're hosting yes, yes, something yes, 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 yes. is talk about yourself. No. Well, you can, but they don't listen after a but while. But our job is to basically talk to other people who are really interesting. Yes. Our job is not to be interesting. Correct. It's to get the interesting people to talk about themselves. Absolutely. So you being an interesting person, uh, let's get back to well, 5DN. Well, I, I, uh, I came over and had lunch with... Uh, Paul Linkson, who was the GM mm -hmm. at the time, he was a very, very good yes. general manager. Very he could have run. Man. He could have run the whole network. He understood people. He understood talk radio. He was uh, uh, he was just picky enough. He wanted. He knew that nothing was going to be perfect, but yep. he wanted things to be as perfect as they possibly could be. So we all strove. But that's a, that's someone who lives. The business again. Yes, isn't yes, it? yes. We all strove to deliver the best programs, mm. and I think we did very successfully. Uh, and that went on and on. So the Court of Public Opinion, that yes. program that ran for so long, <clears throat> what was the motivation for you behind it? Were you trying to, well, putting sort of casually save the world with information? No, 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 no. I, I, I believe in democracy. I believe the rule believe in the rule of the majority and the court of public opinion is the most powerful court in the land for no other reason other than the people make it so. Because you've got the opinions. The people, mm -hmm. their opinion, the people make it so. Yeah. And I think it is just a great name for a television program. At the moment, I, I just to keep my mind working, I uh, have a little studio set up in my garage and we do a Facebook page, mm -hmm. which um, a friend of mine, uh, Andy Martin, I met him at, uh, when I was at AA, uh, he saw it and he's podcasting that now through mm -hmm. umpteen different uh, radio. Uh, I don't understand this modern no, technology well, of podcasting is, and all this really stuff. Really, this is but where radio's gone. That's, yes, that's I suppose the, you're right. And un yep. unfortunately for radio stations, unless they can come up with something new, they're just going to disappear because now anyone can make radio. That is right. Anyone can, with, a, with a computer mm -hmm. or even an iPhone mm -hmm. can be a radio station. Yep. Shoot a movie on an iPhone now. Yep. Yeah, you know, that tech, you must have seen amazing changes in technology. Well, the only thing that uh, can't be done is to substitute talent, experience, knowledge, mm -hmm. charisma, and that's something. That's something that when I was in management and ownership, I trained myself to look for it. It is that something in a person. Mm. I can't tell you what it is. But God, well, I know it when I see it. It's the X it. Factor. Um, you know, programs called the X Factor aren't mm. really what the X Factor is. The X Factor is something that just goes bang. You're right in somebody else's head. Yes, yes. Straight away. We all understand what we mean. But funnily enough... It's like having a friend. It's, it's like having a best friend. Yes, but you've got to recognise, and, and management's role is to see, sometimes in a person, yeah. and get out of him or her what he or she can't actually get out of oneself. I understand. It's, that's a really creative part of the business that nobody cares about now because I'm quite convinced all radio and television stations are run by accountants. 
Well, I think there are other motives behind it all as well. But let's, let's talk we about... We have to make the money. I don't mind if they no, count it. No, <laughs> that's an important fair thing. Fair enough. Yeah, that's very, but you're very never valid. going to make money if you don't understand well, how you, to entertain the people. Quite right. You did well over the years, but not only financially, but you did so well in awards. Now, it's always... Yes. It's difficult to say, just list a few of your awards, but list a few of your awards. Uh, well, uh, I love the, word, the knighthood. Oh, yes, yes. Well, that's, that's actually... Uh, most people think of the Order of uh, St Michael and St George, but that came along in about 1400, I think. Mm-hmm. But the Order of St John goes back to uh, the Knights Templar. Yep. It goes back to the Crusades. And that was a real thrill. Uh, a great honour. Well, I suppose that's really because of your programme. You were a crusader. Oh, we also did an awful lot of work in the community. Well, you've yes, you've also won a great deal of respect and awards for your charity work and all of the other things that you've done in life. Well, the, the point amazing. is, uh, 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 who was it who said that? Was it Kennedy, uh, of whom much is given, much is asked or much is expected? True, true. So I, I think you have to give back as often and as abundantly as you can. Well, you're quite right about giving back because there is an expectation. It's like, I think, uh, personalities on radio, television, film stars, whatever, that the fact that people love you to the extent they do or mm. respect you to the, to the extent that they do, they expect something back from you if you don't give it. And what they expect back, I think, is the friendship yes. in a way because I think... We all see people we know on the screen or on radio, we listen to their voice. We sort of feel they're our best friend. We feel comfortable yes, with yes. them. Well, on many occasions, uh, you would get a call from uh, somebody who was desperate. I mean, really desperate for one reason or another. And you can change their life. Oh, you, you can save their lives. Mm. And that happened more, more than once. So the awards that you've won, both in Australia and in the US, yes. what did you win in the US? Uh, well, they have a thing called the International Radio Festival of New York. And a dear, dear friend of mine, Sue Fraser, uh, who had won when she was at 5AD. She mm-hmm. was the promotions manager, I think, for 5AD. And she said to me, why don't you uh, send that? And I think it was the conversation I had with... Um, a terrorist. Right. Um, Goodness, I remember that. This guy... I remember hearing that. This guy, uh, he... Uh, this was even before the Middle East and uh, the, uh, the whole hate thing between Arab and Christian. Mm-hmm. Mind you, that's been going on since the days of the Crusade. But... Even before, <laughs> really. Yeah. Anyway, he, um, this fellow, he uh, broke into the Brunei Brith building, Mm -hmm. which is a Jewish um, organisation, community organisation in New York. And uh, New York's a very Jewish kind of city. Yes. And uh, this was a terrible, terrible moment because he he took, uh, I don't know how many prisoners, hostages. And I remember the day clearly Marty Smith was the you know, quite brilliant executive producer of uh, 5DN. He walked into the studio and he was, he should have got the award, not me. (laughs) He gave me a piece of paper and he said, this is the number for the Brunei Brith building. Why don't you just cold call them and see what happens? So my producer, Paul Flanagan, I think it was, or it might have been Anne Forward, I've had quite a few producers in my time. Anyway, we rang the Brunei Brith building and this guy picks up the telephone. Of course, this wouldn't happen now because the FBI take out the telephones. Yes, you, but you how can't. extraordinary that this should happen. Well, it was quite blood-chilling. Yeah. Uh, he picks up the telephone. I said, uh, I'm, my name is Jeremy Cordeaux. I'm calling you from the Macquarie Network in Australia. They tell us that there is a siege going on in that building. Could you tell us what's happening? Dead silence for a second or two. And he said, uh, I think 
you need to talk to Abdul. And I said, would, could you get him to the phone? <laughs> ah, yes. Yes. So Abdul comes on and uh, we talk about his threats and his grievances and how he hates Christians and he hates Jews. And he, how oh, amazing. But, and uh, there were several moments in the interview where he said, look, look, uh, I, I now have an audience. People are listening to what I'm saying. This is good. This is good. I tell you what, bring me that woman over there. Bring me that woman. I'll show you how serious I am. And see, this is the danger because some reckless jock who mm. did something like this could, in fact, create a Absolutely. moment where this yes. maniac would kill that woman. Yes. And I thought he was going to do it. Yes. How frightening. All I tried to do is to keep him calm and try to find out why he was doing this. Because there's no way in the world he's going to get out of there alive. And he said, oh, I'm going to cut their heads off and the heads will rain out of the windows of this building. Mm. As uh, Chilling, chilling, chilling. Chilling. Stuff. Jeremy, it's amazing, the career and the things that can happen in We in sold that. that interview back to America because they didn't think of doing it. <laughs> amazing. We've got to take oh, another dear. short break. We haven't talked yet about your amazing car collection, and we'll do that after this. Our guest is Jeremy Cordell, and we've talked about some extraordinary things, but one of the things we haven't talked about is your amazing car collection. Well, I mean, it's been in the making for 40, 45 years. But you've got this massive garage that all these things are housed well, in. Uh, all yeah. these things, these cars. Well, they're, they're also little pieces of history. Yes. Because I, when I started collecting these, they, they, they weren't particularly valuable. But cars are strange. They go up and down in value. But they're lovely things to have. Oh, they are. Do you are. go in and pat them at night and say good night? Yeah, very often I go in there, I take a, a glass of red and I sit down the end where I've got um, a kind of a, I, I suppose it's a set, if you well, like. Well, you did your TV show from well, there. Well, that's true. We did. We did the Court of Public Opinion on Channel 44. Yes. Uh, when my daughter Amber was at Channel yes, 44. She was, she was the executive producer yeah. of the show, in fact. So I have that little retreat, man cave or whatever it is. And I have a lot of the memorabilia. With a fireplace. With a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> there will oh, never yes. be another garage <laughs> with a fireplace. <laughs> because when, I, when the architect said, uh, we, because you've got to put all these things through of the course. bureaucracy, through of the planning. Course. And the reason I got the fireplace was that no one had ever been stupid enough to ever want a fireplace in a garage, but so there was no to, rule. You wanted to keep the cars warm, let's be honest. Well, no, I just wanted the atmosphere. Yes. It's a bit of theatre. On the walls I have, apart from the cars, a lot of the uh, pictures that back in the days of 5DN, particularly 5DN, they were, 5DN was very professional. When we had Sammy Davis Jr. or we had Bob Hawke or uh, Malcolm Fraser or uh, John Howard or whoever it was, uh, John Travolta came It'd in. There'd be a photo taken. It, well, they, ever, there was a professional photographer yes. hired by the station Probably Simon to record Stansbury. the moment. Yes, exactly. No, the show Listen, business. We've, it's a recorded, wonderful thing. we've recorded these moments with you. I think we could go on talking for the next hour or two. Come back another time and tell Be us delighted, yes. all those things that we haven't had the chance to talk about on this program. Yeah, well, it's an, an honour to be on your show. Oh, and I thank you. Thank for... you so much. It's an honour for me. I'm delighted. No. And I hope it's been an honour for you to just meet this man again in person <laughs> who's affected our industry in communication in just so many ways. And we haven't even scratched the surface. And you boys and girls on the floor, thank you for making me feel so welcome. Uh, you're all going to work in television? Yes, I think that's the, that's oh, well. the deal. <laughs> Good so luck. <laughs> until next time, Jeremy. Thank you. Until next time we see you, keep yourself nice. Till then, bye.